You can have this piece of paper that's right there.
praise the Lord today. Would you give God a hallelujah and an amen and a praise the Lord? Whatever you got, give him some praise this morning. Amen. Father, we thank you today that you are the God of all creation and the God who has shown us the depth of your love by sending your son Jesus into our world to pay the penalty for our sin, that we might be forgiven, restored with you. And we thank you and praise you for the power of the resurrection victory that is ours in Christ Jesus knowing that we will rise together with Christ and be with you for all of eternity. God, would you settle this truth in our hearts in a way that leads us to praise and overflow with the grace and love of Christ Jesus into the world around us today. And we'll be sure to give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's so good to be with you here this morning. Thank you for joining us, for being together, either in person or for those of you watching online. We are so glad that you are here and tuning in as well. We hope that uh, your day is going great and that will be even better as we continue worshiping and praising God uh, as the Church of Christ. Hey, it's good to be back in the United States of America. Have an awesome opportunity. Uh, to travel to London uh, with the mission team this past week, and I will I'm kind of chomping at the bit to get to that, but I'm going to have to wait just a little bit. I've got a lot of pictures, and uh, if the brain fog isn't too crazy this morning, I hope to clarify some of the stories and uh, tell you some of the things that we experienced. And I know many of you were praying for me and for our team, and I just want to say so much how I appreciate that. Uh, can I say that God answers prayers too? Man, I know that you've experienced that in your life, and we saw answers to prayer uh, in this past week as well, and so I'm looking forward to sharing some of that, but thank you so much for praying and your support and encouragement of me and the team uh, that we went. Uh, how's everything in Petersburg? You survived, right? So, some trees down, yeah. I tell you what, we need to pray, and uh, I know a couple of requests have come through uh, concerning some of the... Flooding and storm damage out in like, uh, where Eastern Tennessee, Carolinas, and, uh, places like that. Man, it was pretty crazy. Uh, so pray for those in need out in that area, for sure. Um, so, I don't know, I guess I probably need to look at the bulletin to figure out what's going on in life, right? Um, what was that? Scripture reading. Scripture reading? Yeah, that's kind of like We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, <laughs> I'll just say this. If you have a ministry area that you just want to make sure, hey, I need to announce or promote something, then I'm going to give you that moment right now. All right, Penny, I see your hand waving. Uh, the Difficult Youth Group, age 15 above, we've got a sign-up sheet at the Chelly So if you're an older youth, 60 plus, and like chili, or just like hanging out with yeah, people your age, then um, <laughs> that would be an awesome opportunity for you to contact Penny and uh, let her know what you're interested in. So, very good. Anybody? Yeah, Angie. Um, youth group is tonight, 6 to 8.30. We are going to have a dinner with the Lord's Supper, and games. We're going to go to Los Rancheros, because I'm going to be asleep last night, so I'm not cooking. But... <laughs> Just repeat that in case you didn't hear it. If, if, with our 100th 
170th anniversary coming up. If you want to make sure that uh, people you know get invited, maybe some former members that have uh, moved away from here, or uh, friends that you want to make sure get an official invitation from the church, then let us know, and we will add them to the address list. So, thank you for sharing that part. Penny? That's what I was going to ask. Okay. Yeah, so not just the list, but also be watching for the specific plan for that, because it will be a different Sunday than normal. So, details will yeah. be coming, and make sure you read your bulletin and newsletter. Right, so be watching for information and details about what we're planning that day, and there will be a little bit of time and a change on some stuff. I think there's food involved too, right? And a group picture. And a group picture. So that'll always be fun. Right. Very good. Very good. Sure. Okay. I apologize in advance. I did not bring the invitation, but two weeks from today, uh, my sister and my nieces and my daughter will be giving a baby shower for Jared and Whitney. You know, they used to come here, and Jared grew up in this church. Um, you all are invited. I did not bring the invitation. But I, I promise I will have Amy send out information and it will be out there by next Sunday for you to see the address because it will be at my niece's house, not here in the church. But all of you are invited to come and uh, celebrate with Whitney and Jared um, as they expect their new little girl in November. All right, very good. That's coming up pretty quick. Yes. So, a baby shower for Whitney and Jared in November. Sherry will get you. Some uh, invite info on that scene. Very good. Anybody else? Yes. Um, just a praise. We have um, the FCA kickoff is always with um, Seal at the Pole, and uh, it's been a little sparse lately. We have 53 students yes. and they had six faculty members at Seal at the Pole. Yes. 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 FCA, see you at the poll. Great to see that. Excellent. Doug, anything new with you over there in the corner? <laughs> surgery this week. Surgery this week on the heel. Little bit. Yeah. yeah. You're not supposed to fall off those ladders and stuff. But we want to pray for Doug, yes, certainly, dealing with all this. I mean, if you had to pick a time, if you were going to break your heel, I'm going to say this is probably not the ideal season for that either. I'm going to lift him up in prayer as well. Anybody else with a word you want to share today? It's good to see you all, by the way. Y'all look good? How did, uh, how did you enjoy Dan Hartman last week? Amen. Praise the Lord. I just want to say I missed you especially last Sunday night because I had to do the tenor part alone, <laughs> and I have to I have to hear you to be able to sing it. Well, you're in trouble if you have to hear me to sing it. I didn't say I had to hear you to sing it well. <laughs> sing it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so choir's still happening. If anybody's interested in joining choir, you're welcome to still get on board. I'm glad to have my mother-in-law with uh, us this morning, Mildred Clark, so good to see her. Everybody out there? It's good to see you all. Just seeing if there's any new faces. I think I recognize most people. Did you bring anybody? Anybody bring a guest with them today that I might be missing? I see Debbie. She's not, not like a complete guest anymore, right? Yeah, she's more like family. But praise the Lord. So we're going to move into a scripture reading. Isaiah chapter 64. This is good stuff. If you, if you, I'm just telling you, before, before we read this, if you have a real longing in your heart to see God do some amazing things and to just make his presence manifest and known in a powerful, wonderful way, this two verses right here of Isaiah will get you excited just a little bit more for that to happen. And if you're just not sure, like, you know, you're just kind of humdrum about life, man, you, you take these verses to heart, make this the prayer and desire of your soul and see what God does with that. We might start praying in some new ways. But let's go ahead and stand together as we read Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 and 2. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at 
closer to you, to seek your honor and your glory, certainly within the way that we live our life by faith, but also in the lives of others, right here in Petersburg, Illinois, and to the ends of the world, Lord, that all the nations might tremble at the glory of your presence. That is our desire. We pray it for your name's sake. In Christ we ask these things. Amen. Give him honor, give him 
glory. So, so yeah, I want to share with you just a few highlights from our trip. And uh, so you'll have to bear with me because, yes, I am a little bit jet lagged and brain fogged and all of that good stuff. And, and then on top of that, how do, you, how do you put a whole week's worth of experience into just, you know, the next... Uh, two and a half hours. I'm not sure how I'm going to get that all in, but um, I appreciate you hanging in there with me. So um, let me show you some pictures, and you're going to have to just click for me when I when I say click, all right? Because I don't have the uh, clicker with me, and I didn't have the uh, little. Oh, you got that? Oh, well, let's do it that way. That would be better. Thank you. Okay. How many people, by the way, have ever been to London? We've got one, we've got two, we've got three, four, five, we've got a few. Some of you have been there, several of you, actually, and uh, man, it is a pretty amazing city. It is, it is a, it's a little bit big, bigger than Petersburg, um, just by a few million or so. So um, anybody know the population of London? Roughly. Okay, there's a guess of four million. I told some people this morning, so you can't guess if I told you already. <laughs> The population is about 10 million, uh, roughly. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it is a world-class city. It is a huge place. There are, um, you know, we, we say America is kind of a melting pot, but London is a melting pot. There are over 200 nations in London with over 300 languages, different languages spoken throughout the city. Um, Estimates are roughly that about 45% of the people were not born there. They have come in from other nations, other places. I mean, it is, you just you can walk down the street, any street. You choose any street in London. You walk down the street, and you will see the world right there in front of you. We were in a particular uh, neighborhood called Shepherd's Bush. London is comprised of uh, a number of boroughs, and I can't remember that number. It's like 32 or something like that boroughs that kind of make up the entirety of the city. Uh, we were in a place called Shepherd's Bush, adjacent to White City. Those were two areas that we were that we stayed in and uh, did a lot of ministry in. Um, in the Shepherd's Bush neighborhood, there's an estimated 50,000 people population with um, now here, this was, this was a pastor that we were working at who's planting a church in that area. And uh, he said there are probably within that area, maybe five like real gospel-centered churches, and if you added all the believers, devoted followers of Christ within that neighborhood, going to one of those gospel-centered churches, you're probably talking about 200 people, and that would be on the high end of his estimate. The, the need is great in London for the gospel. Uh, the, the people are, are hard to This is kind of like it is across Europe for that matter. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be rambling a little bit today, so just stick with me because I got like a lot of thoughts gelling, and they may not all come out in the same direction and wavelength here. But um, uh, London has an incredible Christian heritage. Uh, some of you might know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop some names for you, all right, this morning. Do you know that uh, some names like John Wycliffe? Anybody heard of Wycliffe Bible translators? Comes out of London. William Tyndale comes out of London. Tyndale Publishing, you know, published all kinds of Bibles and other Christian literature. Um, how many of you know? Let me think for a minute. Uh, I want to say a couple of these, but uh, Charles Spurgeon, great preacher out of London. We actually, uh, I've, got, I've got some pictures in here. Let me just, maybe I should let the pictures help tell the story, and then my thoughts won't be too far off center. I've got to know, right? Sorry, I put it there. I needed to do it so. All right, so I'll just back up a little bit, and then we'll get to some of the things I uh, end up saying. But this is our team that we're just traveling. This is this is your Heartland Baptist Network. The Heartland Baptist Network is made up of churches in the Greater Springfield area. Uh, Greg Alexander, who you see second from right, is the director of missions. Greg has been here. Many of you know him. Um, I'll tell you who else we have starting from the left: Jerry Weber and his wife Sydney. Jerry is the, uh, I don't know what his exact title is. Uh, you can probably help me out up there, Esther. Minister of Education. Minister. Yeah, Minister of Education. Yes. Uh, he does a lot of the operations, administration. He's kind of like the go-to guy at Chatham. Anything you need 
church for Jerry. So that's his wife, uh, Sydney, as well. Uh, the tall dude there, standing about 6'5", is Nate, uh, some or other. I never got his last name. It's, I'm sure he's got a last name, but it's just Nate. Uh, and then uh, Abe didn't go on the trip with us, but he at least waved us goodbye. And you have uh, Carly. Uh, she is also from Chatham. Do you know her as well, uh, Esther? Pure Ready or something like that is her last name. I can't recall exactly how you say that. But, uh, and then Greg, Alexander, I mentioned, and then Jonathan Davis on the far right is the pastor of Delta Church in Springfield. So that was our team. Um, this is a mall called Westfield Mall in um, the Shepherd's Bush area. This, this place is huge. Like malls here are like almost, you go to you know, White Oaks Mall and like, where did the stores go? And where are the people, right? It's hardly anybody. But this, was, this place was crazy packed. It, and it was huge. I've never seen a mall. I mean, the Mall of America, George and I were talking about that earlier, uh, would be a, probably a pretty close comparison. Um, I was even telling her, you go in this mall, and you, if you want to find a store, you go to this big um, screen, like a directory screen, and you can search for the store you want to go to, and then it will you know, create this little layout. It will give you arrows. You know, say, you need to go this way, you need to go this way, and point to it, you might have to go up or down two or three flights of escalators or stairs. And it'll even tell you how long it'll take you to get there. Like, it'll take seven minutes for you to walk from this place to, it's, it's just, a, it's a crazy store, a uh, crazy mall. Uh, but we spent uh, some time here evangelizing on a rainy afternoon when we had outdoor plans and got transitioned, and I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, a bit later. Uh, this was uh, the guy on the right there, looking like he's telling people what to do. That his name is Dave Seckington. He is the church planting pastor of Shepherd's Church in Shepherd's Bush. Uh, he, I think they've been there less than a year, if I remember that. He comes out of a church called Trinity Church in central London. They are planting this church a little bit farther west in the neighborhood called Shepherd's Bush. And so this is a little park area. He's giving us some overview. He led us around the neighborhood. And again, you, you walk down like two blocks of this particular area, and it's just every nation in the world practically is there. We ate at um, Lebanese place in our, in our area. Uh, we ate at, I don't know, I'm forgetting all the places. But just all kinds of foreign international food, and it was, it was all good. Um, Pakistan was another one we had. Um, standing between Nate and Jonathan there in that picture is a man named Kaysen, and he and his wife are from the States, but they have come over. He was, he was a journeyman with the International Mission Board for a while, and served in London, and now has come back over to work with Dave, uh, pretty much full time. So that's what he's doing there. All right, this, we did have a chance to see some of the sites in London, uh, as well as doing the ministry work. This is what they call the Eye, it's a huge Ferris wheel. We did not have time to do that as a ride, but it sits on the Thames River. It's not Thames, right? It looks like it should be pronounced Thames, it is called the Thames. Apparently, they like clocks over there. This is a big clock. I don't know if you've ever heard of this one before. Big Ben. They like their red double-decker buses as well. We did get to do planes, trains, and... No, we didn't do all of those. We did buses. Uh, we did... Uh, we actually did a river Uber on the river as well. So that was pretty cool. Uh, this is, I heard somebody say it, Westminster Abbey. Did not get a chance to go inside, although I would wish, I wish, I had, there's, there's a lot of reasons I have to go back to London now to see a lot of the things more that we did not get to see earlier. Um, guess who we found? <laughs> In London. None other than Abe Lincoln. He's got his own statue. This was, uh, there's a little courtyard area right outside of uh, the Big Ben and Parliament that sits together there. And then now, Churchill is like the main statue guy, right? You can't miss Churchill on a statue. But a lot of other 
uh, major world influencers uh, around the area as well, including Abraham Lincoln. They still do have a bunch of those sitting around too. I don't think they're operational. I think they're just there for show. But uh, anyway, you get the uh, iconic look of the telephone booth. This is Piccadilly Circus, if you've heard of that, somewhere along the line. It's uh, something like Times Square, if you want to compare stuff. There were people packed everywhere within this area. This was a Saturday night, and we were, this picture is taken from the, from the top of a double-decker bus. And, uh, we, were, we were just taking this, it wasn't even a tour, we were, we were, going, we were going home at this point. Uh, but the bus was taking us around. And, we, we would just go block after block after block, and it was just, it was packed just like this. People just everywhere. Some of the architecture and buildings, a lot of them, a lot of them look like that. Some of the places to that town. Uh, this was, so I mentioned that Charles Spurgeon preached in London at the Metropolitan Tabernacle Church for, uh, I think he was there 28 years, if I remember that right. And uh, I, this wasn't really a scheduled thing, but I really wanted to go to that church, and so I, we didn't have other plans Sunday night. But if anybody wants to come with me, you know, let's go. And we did. We had a few of us that went Sunday night and we went to, to that church. It's not the same building uh, that Spurgeon preached in because it had been bombed during uh, one of the wars. It's been rebuilt a time or two. But, uh, but anyway, the, some of the uh, facade is actually still there. But I thought that was just pretty cool just to be in that. That's, that's what that looks like on the inside. So, now that one is a pretty plain looking sanctuary compared to some of the other incredibly impressive architecturally you know, magnificent cathedrals that we also went into. I don't think I can show you those pictures right here. But, uh, this is... I'm sorry? No? This is St. Paul's Cathedral, a huge church. We, um, we did not go in, but we did take a tour. It's called a Christian Heritage London Tour. We had a, a guy who's from London. His name is Ben Virgo. He has a podcast and different ministries uh, out there. He's, he's actually a church planter himself among a, the Bangladesh Muslims in London. Uh, but he also gives tours. We took a tour uh, starting here at St. Paul's Cathedral. Just explaining some of the history behind London, just how rich some of that uh, Christian heritage is. By the way, uh, the stats will tell you that about 40% of people in London will claim to be Christians. But as he and others explained to us, that's a wildly inflated number. That probably just means that they're not. Muslim, and they're not Hindu, and I mean, that's it's just kind of a default. Well, we're in England, so we're Christian, you know, but uh, but really the estimates are more like two or three percent of people in London are Christian, even though many will claim it as a, a title. This church, uh, well, I can't remember the name of it, it's not coming to me, but I can tell you who preached there. And it was John Newton. How many of you know the name John Newton? Is that familiar to anybody? What do you know about John Newton? He is the author of the song Amazing Grace. Everybody knows the song. Not many people you know, know who John Newton is or the story behind uh, where he came from. Uh, very quickly, I've told this before, I'm sure, but uh, bear with me. John Newton was a wretched man by his own admission. Uh, he was a drunk. He was a violent brawler. He was a, a captain of a slave trade ship. Uh, he, he was just as nasty and wicked as you could imagine. He understood that. But God rescued him. God answered some prayers and brought John Newton out of the life that he was living and into a brand new way of life where he ended up becoming a, a pastor of a church. He pastored this church for 20, uh, 35 years, I think it was. Um, had a long, long ministry at that church. Um, but yeah, Amazing Grace was the song that John Newton wrote about his own life that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. 
And I had the, this is one of my highlights, I had the incredible privilege of reading some scripture from the pulpit that John Newton preached from in that very church. Pretty reasonable. Uh, part of our Christian Heritage Tour also took us to the British Museum. And within the British Museum, I, the, the guy told us, Ben told us that there are, like, I think the number was like 80 million artifacts at the British Museum. But they can't put them all out on display at once. So they, they like, select the, I, I think he said 80,000 or something, you know, best artifacts and kind of put those on display and have some other rotating things. But, this, uh, and we didn't see them all, we, uh, we saw a few, but uh, this was a silver platter, there's no way you can read the inscription over there, but uh, inscribed on the inside of that platter is an inscription uh, concerning King Xerxes, who is referenced in uh, the scripture, obviously, uh, talking about these platters that were made and were used by him. Now, the connection that Ben was telling us, and some of you will note this as well, is that uh, there is a prophet named Nehemiah from the Bible who was a cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah probably, probably held this platter in his hands in serving the king and uh, others in that court. So pretty fascinating thing to really think about some of that history. Was, I won't take any more time on the British Museum, but uh, just some amazing thoughts. Uh, this is not in the British Museum, but this is the world famous Felix the Beaver. Everybody knows Felix the Beaver, right? Um, at uh, the London School of Economics. So, um, let's see where, I guess I'll just yeah, keep going right around here. Um, so, I'm going to transition from some of the you know, stuff we saw in London to some of the more ministry type work we did. Um, the big overview is that in the mornings, we served at two different college campuses that the Trinity Church in Central London was trying to reach out to the students. They call it Freshers Week. Uh, it's where all the kids come in for orientation, and before classes started, they you know, get uh, get their schedules. They start making connections with clubs, organizations, and stuff. So the church had a presence at uh, these two schools. This one and another one I'll show you in a minute. Um, where we were there throughout the morning, handing out a bottle of water, handing out pieces of chocolate, and trying to engage students as they were out and about on campus, telling them about the church, inviting them to events that the church was hosting for them, particularly. So we, we made a lot of connections. We handed out, uh, I know one morning, he said we gave out 300 bottles of water just in one morning, and, uh, but they were there throughout the entire day. Our team could only do the morning. But um, so they were they were making all kinds of connections with a lot of kids. It was kind of like this though. There, in, in, uh, and you'll see this in the other one a little bit more. But just so many students coming in from like all over the world, and we're standing out there just trying to see if God's going to you know give us some opportunities to, to speak to people. And we did. We had chances to you know some of the kids would actually stop and they would take your. They, and they were so polite. If they if they took a piece of chocolate from you. They knew that they were giving you some time to tell them about why you were there and what you were doing for the most part. So, so that gave us many, many opportunities to you know, share a little bit about the church, why we were there. Uh, not a lot of in-depth gospel conversations, but a lot of touches, a lot of seeds uh, through that ministry. Uh, one of the most famous icons at that school, London School of Economics, is this globe. Now, I don't know if you can tell from your seat there. But do you notice anything different about that globe? It's upside down. Right. So the artist behind this did it intentionally. It's not like, oh man, we laid that thing upside down and we can't get it turned. No, so um, it's just a way of helping artistically see the world from a different perspective. And it's kind of cool actually looking at it that way. But anyway, we found uh, Springfield, Illinois on the map, on the globe. I just had to point that out for you. One of my memorable encounters from this particular school was actually not with a student. It was with a, um, a couple of parents. I could, I could see the, this older couple sitting on one of the benches at the school there. And, I mean, you can, you can spot parents at a university like from a mile away, right? You know? But uh, they had just dropped their daughter off, and, and these parents were from Malaysia. And 
spoke to me about how their daughter for the last two years had been in depression. And they were, you know, a little concerned about leaving her and then having to go back all the way to their home nation of Malaysia. And so I had a chance to share a chocolate with them and tell them, hey, so there's, a, there's a church that's here for the purpose of caring for people like your daughter and just encourage them to get connected uh, if possible. But, uh, anyway, it was kind of a neat moment. So this is the other school. This is um, the University College of London. All these schools, there are, by the way, there are 95 plus universities or schools uh, for higher education in London. Uh, King's College is another one that might be familiar to you. We, we didn't serve there this year, but our teams in the past years have served on that campus as well. Uh, but these are all very prestigious well-known schools. I mean, kids are coming from all over the world to go to these schools. We saw probably more Asian, China, Asia area kids, uh, certainly a lot more than you know, what would look like people that live in London. Come from everywhere. So anyway, just you see the welcome banners and inviting the kids. And this is one little gated area where it's pretty much the main entrance. And it felt like just a you know, fire hydrant pouring kids in all day long. I mean, they're just in, they were out, and in and out. And again, we did the same thing at this campus and just uh, hoping to have a few opportunities for conversation. And we did. Uh, this is um, uh, one of the guys that works with the Trinity Church there, serving at the table and talking to some students that are there. And so we're just making connections, seeds dropped in in all kinds of ways. Uh, pray for some fruitfulness. But it was kind of cool because Dave Seckington, who was the, the church planting pastor at the Shepherd's Bush Church, who came out of the Trinity Church, there's going to be a quiz later too, by the way, in case you just want to remember everybody. Um, he read us a text from Malcolm, who is the pastor at Trinity Church, from just a week ago before our team came, but they had, had other teams. Uh, I guess a week, the week prior to us being there, they, they asked within the church service, so how many of you are here because you have because you were welcomed during Freshers Week by one of our teams giving you information? And uh, he said there were about ten international students that raised their hand and had gotten a flyer just out of nowhere, decided to go to that church. So that's just that's just out of the, the first week's work. And then we followed up with the second week of stuff. So so God is using that to bring some people at least to a step closer to knowing about. Christianity and knowing about salvation in Christ. All right, so that was in central London, most of, most of what I was showing you there. Now, this is going out west to Shepherd's Bush and, and White City. These are adjacent areas. But the church plant that I referred to is meeting currently inside this community center. And they have been very gracious to allow the church to meet in there uh, for Sunday morning services. That's where, we, that's where I was at last Sunday, by the way, Scott. King of Kings and Revelation Song were joint worship songs that we sang last week in London. Believe it or not, pretty amazing. So, so one of our ministry days in the afternoon involved going to this community center, and uh, you can see some of the uh, brush and stuff there. And a lot of they, they had a kind of a nice little garden area, but it had been really not taken care of and overrun. So we we just did some hands-on labor. We spent an afternoon trimming out from that area, picking up trash. Uh, a couple of our ladies were inside reorganizing closets and cupboard areas just to make the community center itself a nicer place, more welcoming. But for the church planter and the church meeting area, it builds a lot of credibility and trust to say, hey, we're not here just to rent out your space. We want to serve, we want to serve this community. And so uh, the lady, Janice was her name, that kind of runs this place. Uh, she, she was just overwhelmed with appreciation uh, for what we did, just, uh, even in that one afternoon. And kind of a, a cool tag to that is that the next, you know, two day, I guess two days later, Friday, um, we had split up into some prayer walking teams that were going even door to door asking people how we could pray for them. And one of our teams came across Janice in her apartment complex and uh, had a chance to 
reconnect with her and even to pray specifically for her and some of the needs that she had as well. So, so it's, let me just say this, it's slow going work in London. I mean, people aren't just lining out up outside the doors of these churches uh, saying, sirs, what must we do to be saved? You know, you're not seeing that happen right now. But I do believe that God is doing a work and doing some incredible things in the city and that even these small little efforts are going to not be in vain, but God will use them to reach some people for Jesus. So this is one of the other days. Um, it does rain a lot in London, and uh, we we had several rainy days. Uh, this was one day in particular where we were outside. Uh, you see, setting up uh, a table outside of an apartment complex uh, with literature, actually Bibles in several different languages, and just trying to engage people as they would come by. And th this group, that's Jerry, Sydney, and Carly, uh, were kind of stationed there as two other teams, including myself and Kason, and Jonathan, and uh, somebody. Anyway, uh, we went out into the neighborhoods knocking on doors and, and praying. And I'll tell you one particular, uh, well, in fact, Kason and I were together, and, uh, and we knocked, the first door we knocked on, uh, this Muslim gentleman, Abdullah, opened the door, and we ended up having a conversation with him for probably about an hour and a half. We were standing outside in a little bit of a drizzle for a while, and he, he invited us in, and he was very knowledgeable about the Muslim tradition, what he believed, but he was also very willing to listen to what we believe the Bible says. And he was, we shared the gospel as clearly as we could, we, and, you know, Spent a lot of time kind of going back and forth on some of the points, you know, well, here's what Muslims believe. Well, here's what, here's what we believe the Bible says about that. Uh, kind of fascinating. I learned, a, I learned more about Islam in an hour and a half than I ever have in my life, you know, just from talking with, with him. But one of the main things that stuck with me that, uh, that he said is that they really have no assurance of salvation or eternal life. They're, they are hoping and uh, hoping that basically, when it boils down to it, that their good deeds will be good enough to get them there. If they've done the right things, if they've forgiven, and uh, just uh, several factors, but, but at the end of the day, they have no assurance. So we really pressed into that and said, well, we, here's how we can know that we have assurance. It's because Christ has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. We can't be righteous, we can't be good enough. And so we Share the gospel with that pretty clearly. Anyway, it was pretty interesting. All right, so let me back up a little bit. Is my next one the uh, big bit again? Or is there something else? Oh, okay, I'll give you that one too. All right, so this was also, you probably can't read that up there, but uh, we put a whiteboard out that day with just a question for passerbys to try to engage in it. This particular question we put on that day was, uh, what do you want God to do for you? Just gives it, a, it's like an open door, right? You're just seeing what people think about God. And, and people would respond and check off some things, but it gave us a chance then to you know, share a message of the gospel with people just on the street there. All right, what's, what's the next one? Okay, so I'm going to back up a little bit. I don't have a picture of this, but you remember that mall that I showed you earlier? So we went uh, one day when it was raining, we were planning to do some outdoor things, and we couldn't, so we got redirected to an inside activity, which was. Um, the church saying, well, what we're going to do today is we're just going to go to the mall and pray, prayer walk the mall, try to engage people with the gospel, uh, if you have opportunity to do that. And I try not to tell the story in, you know, too long, but um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to back up a little bit. When we were doing the morning work at the universities, I mentioned we were, we were handing out water, handing out candy, you know, trying, trying to, like, see if God would just bring one or two kids along, but it, it really felt like just a rush of students, and even if you had somebody stop for like 30 seconds, you felt like, man, that's a win, right? I had 30 seconds to tell them about this church and what we're doing, and, but most of the conversations, that's as much as you got. They were on their way to somewhere, doing something, and it was just uh, hardly, I, I, I felt personally like, are we even being effective in doing this? You know, are we getting anywhere? Is anybody... You know, you see them take those flyers politely, but 
you know, they're probably finishing them as soon as they got a chance to. So I was, I'll be honest, I was feeling a little discouraged and disheartened, thinking, well, I'm just not sure if this is accomplishing anything. And I was really praying about what God would do, and, and I wanted to be more fruitful, more effective. Well, this this afternoon, this rainy afternoon, when our plans got derailed, changed, is when I really felt God's brought me here for this reason. And so we went to the mall, and we paired up in twos, and I was with Carly at this time. And, uh, and I, was, I was kind of in this mindset, like, right, we're going to go to the mall. How do, you, how do you even engage people at the mall, right? People who don't really want to be bothered, and what do you do? Just stop people in the middle of the aisle, and I need to tell you about Jesus today. So, so we, it was just kind of overwhelming to think about what we're going to do. So um, our first thought was just, well, we're just going to pray. We're just going to pray as we go. So we were praying as we were walking down the hall of the mall, just asking God, would you just lead us to the right person, the right place, whatever you want us to do, let's be sensitive to that. And we're praying that as we're going. And I come to the, the seating area, and we're just that we'll just, just have a seat. There was a guy sitting by himself, and I thought, well, maybe this will be a, an opportunity. So we sat down, and they had given us some candy bars as ways of just saying, hey, do you want to, you mind answering a question or two for us, and we'll give you a candy bar? Uh, that seemed a little hokey to me, personally. Don't tell Casey and Dave, I know they might be watching this online, but uh, it seemed a little hokey to me, but we, whatever, you know, so, um, so we sat down, and I pulled this, these candy bars out of my backpack, and Laid them on the table, and I thought, well, maybe, uh, you know, maybe I'll have a conversation with this guy sitting next to me. And, uh, but before before I could do anything, all of a sudden, three other people come in, like his family, and they sit down right there with him. And I'm thinking, well, there probably goes that opportunity to do that. Uh, but to my surprise, he looks over and sees our candy bars and makes some kind of comment about, you know, man, that looks pretty good. Got any extras or something like that? I can't remember what he said. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, let me just go ahead and give you one. And then it led to an opportunity to start talking about why we were sitting here with these candy bars and um, asked him a question, just a kind of survey-type question. I can't even remember what, what it was, but it had something to do with the faith or with Christ. And, and I'm telling you what, that opened a floodgate of conversation and opportunity with all four of these people in this family. And uh, they were peppering questions to us, like left or right. I, would, I was just about ready to answer and get my Bible out, but then two other questions would come in, and this conversation was all over the place, but, but we did have a chance to share our testimony and share our faith in Christ and uh, give people, give, give these four a chance to um, you know, express some of where they were at. And so, anyway, I, it wasn't like super fruitful to the point where they were asking, how do I get to be saved or anything like that? But anyway, they had to leave. But as they were leaving, this guy that was first there said, I think that's your next person you need to talk to right over there. Because the entire time, this other lady sitting at the table next to us was like listening in. My back was kind of turned to her that way, but he had noticed that she was there. So he gave us our next contact, which was pretty cool. So we just turned over to her and said, hi, how are you doing? And she was listening in and a little bit, then pretty soon her friend came and sat down with her, so we had a chance to talk to both of them. They were from Egypt and uh, been in a Coptic Christian church, or well, Coptic, I've heard of that, but I don't know what, what they believe about anything, you know. So we had a chance to kind of compare notes a little bit, and I got my Bible out, and we, we shared the gospel, and I had a really good conversation with them. As we're talking with them, another lady sitting in the seating area comes over and, uh, and says to Carly and I, I really appreciate what you're doing. Keep up the good work. It's a real encouragement to see you doing that. Her and her daughter uh, have been listening. They were Christians. And uh, it's like, wow, in a city that you know maybe 2 or 3% are really Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christians, these two came over and encouraged us to keep doing what we're doing. It was like a little touch from God that we needed. So, so we're talking with these two ladies, and um, they ended up having to, to leave eventually. And uh, so we're just sit, still sitting there, and, and I look up and see, this isn't just a regular seat here, this is like a Starbucks. And I thought, you know what? It is mid-afternoon. I could probably use a cup of coffee and to kind of buy our space, you know, and not just to be sitting at a table. I went around the little corner there to, to buy a cup of coffee. And I'm in line buying a cup of 
coffee. Uh, there's a guy behind me, and, uh, and the lady, the, cash, the cashier says, um, listen, I just want you all to know that our, our machine is down. You can't do the auto pay, you know, Apple Pay kind of stuff right now. You need to have a physical card to put in the machine or pay with cash. And he's like, I don't have any cash with me, and we didn't have a credit card. But anyway, side note, but London is almost a cashless society. I mean, just about. Every, everything we paid for was, was like with the credit card or Apple phone type stuff. So, not like Apple Pay. Anyway, uh, so he's kind of like bummed out because he was in line, you know. And, uh, I said, hey, dude, it's all right. I'll, I'll go ahead and buy whatever you're going to get. Just go and get it, and I'll, I'll pay for it. So, I have credit card. And, uh, so, so, we get up there, and uh, so I put my credit card in, and then that's not working. It's like, you know, that's kind of, you know, neither one of us are going to get our coffee, right? But uh, I said, well, let me get my phone out. I'll just try to tap it and see what happens. So, so I did, and it started working. We approved our purchase. So, not a, not a real big deal, other than to say that I would not have met Simon if it were not for the fact that the cashier said, you know, you, you know what he can pay unless you got cash or whatever. So, uh, so I offered to pay for him. I ended up buying his uh, drink and um, made a new friend. And he said, thank you. He's very appreciative. He took his drink, went over, found a table, which happened to be right where those two ladies before had left and vacated right next to where I was sitting. So we had a chance to Kind of further our conversation, and Simon was like really open to hearing the gospel. He, he kind of believed a lot of different things, you know, like a lot of people do. You know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, but we had a chance to share very clearly about who Jesus was and why he was the only way to the Father. And uh, he was really engaged, really interested uh, in all of that. And we were able to leave him with a copy of the scripture, with a tract about how to, what Christianity is all about. Can't say that he became a Christian that day, but he was genuinely, you could see God working in his heart and uh, moving him. So I'm, I'm praying for Simon that God will take the seed that was planted and somebody else can come along and water it, somebody else can you know, lead him to a place of salvation. But I believe God is doing the work in his life. Um, all right, where, where was I at? Um, yeah, so anyway. I guess that was about the end of that part. Oh, no, there, were, there was one other lady. There was one other lady listening in while we were talking to Simon, and she, after he left, she came over and uh, said something to the effect of, um, you know, I, I heard you guys talking, and when you talked about Jesus, it really warmed my heart. And those were her words, something quite like that. And so we talked with her a little bit, too, and we ended up having to go. We'd been there for probably an hour and a half or so, and uh, we were meeting back with her other people at this point. But I don't know. There, I think there were other people listening in on our conversation too. So I don't know how many people were hearing about Jesus right there at that Starbucks in the mall. But God's put a lot of seeds out there, and we're going to just pray that He'll bring a lot of those to fruition. So. Anyway, there's a, there's a picture of Big Ben. I'm going to. Uh, I'm just going to close this with a challenge, an invitation and a challenge to to all of us. Tonight. The invitation is this. If you have not yet believed in Jesus, why not? What, what would be holding you back? Why would you not give your heart and your life to Christ? What more would he have to do to show you how much he loves you, how much he cares for you? Uh, that, that he would send his own son into our world to pay the penalty on the cross, to die a death in our place, to take the wrath of God against our own sin so that we can be Forgiven, set free, made new, made right with God. And he rose from the dead on the third day, conquering death so that we can have the hope of everlasting life. Why would you not believe in him when he gives you peace, when he fills you with joy, when you've got an unshakable hope and a foundation that will not be moved? Why would you reject this king of kings who wants to invite you into his presence and adopt you as a child into his family so that you can call on him as Abba Father. What would, why, why wouldn't you do that? My invitation to you is to believe today, to trust him, to turn away from sin, to turn away from your self-efforts, to trust in Jesus. Abdullah, he, unless he comes to Jesus, he's always going to wonder what's going to happen when he dies. But the Christian never has to wonder that. 
because we have an absolute assurance that Christ has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. We cannot be good enough. You're not going to get to heaven, and we talked about this with him too, where the scales of justice are going to be weighed out, your good deeds and your bad deeds, and you're just hoping your good is going to rise. Well, it's, it's not going to happen that way. Christ has paid it all, and we owe all to him. I'm just I'm pleading with you, maybe somebody watching online today, to trust in Jesus for your salvation. For God so loved the world, and he loves each and every one of you, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what he wants for his people. That's what he wants for you. So that's my invitation. But here's my challenge to you. If you've not fully surrendered your life to Jesus, why not? Maybe you're just comfortable coming in for a Sunday morning. Comfortable, you know, just hanging out with a good, awesome group of people right here, right? Uh, but just not fully on board. You're okay with just this measure of the Sunday morning Christian activity, but it doesn't carry over into your life on Monday, and it's not, you're not looking for opportunities to pray for people through the week and serve and love and share your faith with others. And I would say, why not? What would prevent you from going just all in? Just getting on board with what Christ wants you to do, to live your life on mission for him. Because I'm telling you, that's where we find great fulfillment in life. Doing what God has called us to do. Sharing the gospel with people. Listen, I've got a long way to go. I've, I've got a long, long, super long way to go. But I want to take that next step. And I want you to take that step with me. I want us to be a church that gets on our knees and prays passionately and earnestly for lost people to come to salvation in Jesus. I mean, if we're just coming to church on Sunday morning and singing songs of praise, that's great. We need that. But if that's all it is, then we're missing out on some greater work that God wants us to do. Do you know that the harvest is plentiful? I'm telling you, in London and in Petersburg, the harvest is plentiful. But the problem in both places is the same. There are just not enough people willing to do the work. I'm saying, why don't you just raise your hand and say, where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to serve? I'm all in. I'm all yours. Can we take that step together as a church? Let's be the ones who pray and see what God wants to do in us and through us. And let's say, God, just wherever you want to send me, that's where I will go. I had this thought, and I'll close with this. You know, in a city the size of London, 10 million people, it's crazy, they're everywhere. But what would it be like, wouldn't this be awesome, if Jesus were to become the talk of the town? If people on the tube, which is their subway system, started having conversations about Jesus on their way into the city, on their way home from work at the end of the day, waiting at the bus stop, they're just talking about what Jesus has been doing in their life. When they're at work, when they're at in the park, and they're just, when they're seeing all these incredible sights throughout the city, what if the conversation was just about what Jesus was doing, about how he had walked with them in the fire, how he had been with them in the trouble, how he was blessing them by his mercy, watching over them by his goodness and grace day after day. What if Jesus began to talk to the town of London? What if Jesus began to talk to the town of Peter's And people here, as we go about our conversation, we're not just talking about the weather. We're not talking about harvest fest. And we're not talking so much about stuff going on in town. We're talking about what Jesus Christ has done to bring salvation to our souls. Wouldn't that be pretty amazing? It can happen. But it's not going to happen unless we start getting out, sharing the message of the gospel with people. If it's first in our heart and on our lips to share that good news with people all around us. Will you pray for an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody this week? I, I have no doubt in my mind that every one of you will have an encounter with somebody who needs Jesus in your life this week. And if you're not sure about it, then pray for it and see that God will open up the door of opportunity for that to happen. And then let's be ready. Let's have Jesus on our lips so that when that moment comes, we will not be fearful, we will not be afraid. God, do not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of self-control. And like Paul, I think we all can say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile. And 
let's just go out. Let's share the gospel. Let's tell people about how they can have everlasting life in him. Because if we don't, you know what happens? They continue on that broad road that leads to destruction. And there we were just waving to them on the way. And Charles Spurgeon said it this way. Come back in here as a wrap this up saying, let no one go there. If, if anyone must go to hell, let no one go unwarned and unprayed for. Let it be as if we were wrapping our arms about their knees to keep them from continuing down that road. Let that be said of us right here. Father, we pray for that today. Lord, stir our hearts. Set our hearts ablaze with the message of the gospel that people need to hear. It is good news in a bad news world. Oh, and Lord, there are so many people living in hopelessness and despair, just going about their lives day after day, but without the hope of Christ, without the promise of better things to come, without peace, and even without joy that comes in knowing you, living purposeless and meaningless lives. But God, you've got the answer for it all in your son, Jesus Christ. And you have purchased our salvation by his blood, and I pray that that would be a message quickly on our lips. And the hope of eternity by his resurrection power, Lord, that ought to be something that we're talking about all the time with people. I pray, even within my own heart, that that will change. I pray that for your church today. A friend, if you're here listening in, maybe watching online, and you heard that invitation saying, why not? Why not today? Why not give your heart and your life to Christ today? And you don't have any other reason. There's nothing else that you can use as a defense or justification, but, but you're ready to come to Christ. Then just invite him in through faith. Let him be the king of your heart. Let him forgive you for your sin. Trust him today by what he has accomplished for you on the cross and by the empty grave. That you're ready to give your life fully to him. The question is, why not? Why not surrender to Jesus today? Thank you, Father, for hearing the prayers of your people. Let us go forth in new power, walking in your spirit, with the word of the gospel in our hearts, in our heads, and on our lips. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our closing song? This is the invitation song. This is... Yeah, this is where you've got to make some stuff happen. I'm not saying you make it happen. You make your commitment to the Lord. Give Him your heart, your life, your all today. Come to the altar if you need to. Surrender some stuff. Whatever you've got to do, yielding your life to Him. And I'll be here to pray with you if you want me to do that too. Let's sing the Christmas.
So thank you again to all who have supported and encouraged me and prayed for me and for this team on this trip. Your, your prayers were answered. We, we made it back. That was a, a big part of that as well. And then God put a lot of gospel seeds in the hearts of a lot of people over the past week. Keep praying for that to be brought to fruition. All right, any further word before we dismiss today? Well, God bless you as you go. May he keep you in his grace.